get into the spirit, the reason for the season, and that is praising God, praising Jesus, thanking Him for all of our blessings. So let's stand up and give Him all of our voice and all the glory this morning. Amen? Amen.
God this morning in Jesus' more beautiful name. Pastor Mark Harvey. Thank you so much, Tracy and Art. It's good to sing some Christmas songs again. Uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and uh, many churches celebrate that. We've done that before. We've had the candles, the five Sundays of Advent, and lighting those. But it's good to start that joyous time together. I'm so glad you came to worship the Lord here. And uh, today we have uh, received uh, from Brian and Diane an application for church membership. So we're excited about that. We are working on uh, getting warm water uh, for them to <laughs> baptize in. They, they finished our three-week uh, uh, baptism class that we have. And I'm sure that they receive Jesus and understand our uh, traditions here. And so as soon as we get that hooked up and uh, I get the baptistry going, we will have them baptized and then uh, receive them from members here. But we're so glad you all are here. The Lord's led you here. And I hope you and all of your friends and all the apartments. Thanks for coming out and join us. We've got room here for me. Um, I'm excited about uh, our walk through Luke. We began last week with the Gospel of Luke. And we talked about getting ready, being prepared for the coming of the This Luke chapter 1 is uh, getting everybody ready. Getting Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, all of them ready for Luke chapter 2, which is going to be the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem. And so last Sunday we started off and we began with uh, getting prepared. This uh, child is going to come uh, and he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And it's interesting to me that our second, our very second study in the book of Luke now is going to be about doubt. Doubt. And I wanted us to look at uh, the, this uh, quote from Zechariah, How Can I Be Sure? And that's in uh, Luke chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to begin back in verse 11 and read that again uh, to set the stage for uh, Zechariah's words. Uh, uh, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the far right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man. My wife is well along in years. And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because... You did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Heavenly Father, we come before you on this Lord's day to worship you. And we thank you for these words from the Gospel of Luke about the angel Gabriel coming before Zechariah with this good news of answered prayer. And yet we are faced with his doubts. How can I be sure? And Father, we don't judge Zechariah. We come before you as Sinners saved by grace. And we confess that we have doubts. We have doubts and hardships in our lives. And so we ask us today, through your word, to encourage us to overcome our doubts and to find faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I uh, was in seminary when I really had my first round of doubts. Uh, I had grown up in a Christian church. My father was pastor of a church. Uh, I was in Sunday school, a youth leader. Uh, went to uh, a 
Christian college, Grand Canyon College, and served the Lord in churches. And it was not until I got to seminary, where pastors are supposed to go, that I really began to doubt uh, all of this, because we began to take the Bible apart, and we found out that it comes from all of these different manuscripts, and they've all been translated. We began to study all these different views about God. It's the first time I'd ever studied about men uh, who really doubted the truth of the gospel. We, we were faced with that in the seminary. And uh, I remember I was in the heat of that, uh, what was going to happen to me, what was I going to believe, and I heard about Billy Graham's testimony. He records this in his autobiography uh, that's called uh, Just As I Am. I don't know if you've seen that book about the autobiography of Billy Graham. But he shares his testimony in there, and I heard about that, and it really uh, helped me during that time in seminary. That was only 100 years ago that I was there. <laughs> Uh, Judy was a young child, she was there with me. But uh, he shared this testimony that uh, at the beginning of his ministry, uh, he was at a, a meeting with a dear friend of his. And uh, he, this friend of his was sharing with him, uh, Billy, you've got to get over this uh, belief that the Bible is true. That's, that's 50 years old stuff. You need to know the new way of looking at things, the new, the new way. And and uh, so, so uh, Billy began to struggle with that belief that everything in the Bible is true for the first time in his life. And so he, he read uh, Paul's statement, uh, 2 Timothy, all scriptures God breathed. He read Peter's statement, 2 Peter, uh, we did not speak on their own, but moved by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' statement, Matthew 24, he began to study all these things. But the, but the battle is still raised in his heart. Is this really true? Is God's word true? That's the basic uh, statement there. And so he read all those things, and he began to study, and then he decided to go out in, in the forest where they were studying, and he went out there and prayed, and he knelt before God, and he said, Oh God, there are many things in this book I do not understand. There are many problems with it. For which I have no solution. I can't answer some of the questions that people are raising. Father, I'm going to accept this Bible as your word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts. And I believe this to be your inspired word. It was a moment in his life when he made a decision to accept the Bible with the historical problems and the things he couldn't explain and, and he decided he made a decision on his knees on that night to accept God's word by faith. Every word was true. And then he says, not all my questions were answered, but a major bridge had been crossed. In my heart and in my mind, I knew a spiritual battle in my soul had been fought and won. And as they say, the rest is history with Billy Graham's life. I, I wanted to come uh, this morning. I, I did not want to skip over this passage and go on and talk about uh, the birth of Jesus being foretold. Because I wanted us to struggle together with Zechariah's response. Here he is. It's his time to come into the temple. He's the priest. He's going to offer the incense. And he's done this before uh, other times. Uh, and he comes to, to this moment, and there is Gabriel, the angel of God, waiting for him. He falls down. He's terrified. He's afraid to see the angel of the Lord. It's the response of everyone in Scripture who's seen an angel. They, they are in fear. And the angel says, fear not. I have good news for you. For 40 years, for 30 or 40 years, you and your wife, Elizabeth, have been praying for a child. I have good news for you. God is granting that wish. I will come back here next year, and you will have a son by your wife Elizabeth, and you'll call his name John, and he will be wonderful. He will turn people from their sins to God. And what is Zechariah's response? The, the man of God, how does he respond? Oh, that's great. Oh, that's wonderful. An answer to prayer. I can't wait to tell Elizabeth. Was that his response? <laughs> he responded like I would respond. You're nuts. 
<laughs> You're crazy. How can this be? I, I'm an old man. And I'm sure he didn't mean to say it, but he said, my wife's an old lady. We, we can't have children at, at this age. We, we accepted our, our prayers have not been answered. Uh, we prayed for 40 years. We accept this. We love God. We're faithful. This, this, how can this be? And so the angel responds. And he responds, God can do all things. And I will come back next year. And you will have a son. And, and that, that response, I want us to look at that because I have had those kinds of doubts in my life. I've trusted the Lord. I followed Him in baptism. I've been involved in this church. And from time to time, I've had serious doubts in, in my heart. And so today, I want us to just take this apart and look at it and see if God could speak to us. Maybe you're here today and you have doubts. Maybe you have been a prayer that's been unanswered. Maybe you're in a situation that's been unresolved and you've prayed to God and there's been no answer. There's only been silence. And, and maybe you have come sometimes to wonder, is there really a God? <coughs> Does this God really love me? And so I want us to look at this response and see that first of all, the first of all, the, the, the problem of doubt, we all struggle with doubt. That's just going to be a fact. When we're involved in a faith-based relationship with a God, we're going to have doubts uh, through television and the media and friends and sometimes spouses and children are going to say, why do you keep, keep on praying that prayer? Why do you keep doing that? Uh, we all struggle with doubt. And I want to share with you the, the, the very first point is doubt is a problem for the righteous. Also, the righteous people in the Bible also struggle with doubt. Here is that right. We, we talked last week. We described him in Luke 1, verse 6. We described him as uh, walking righteous in the sight of God. <laughs> walking blamelessly in commandments and requirements of the Lord. But he still had those doubts. There are other great men and women in the Bible. Righteous people before God who've had doubts. Uh, this, this story really relates uh, very well to Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18? <laughs> Jesus, uh, God, had told Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations in the promised land. Well, Abraham followed. He did everything God asked him to do. He went everywhere God asked him. But now he's an old man. He's 90 years old. And, and there's still, he's never had a son. How is he going to be the father of many nations if he has never had a son? And his wife is 80 years old. And so one day, Genesis chapter 18, verse 10, the angel comes to Abraham and says, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, 80 years old, will have your son. Now, Sarah was listening through the keyhole of the tent. <laughs> she was listening to the entrance to the tent. And Abraham and Sarah were already very old. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing, Genesis 18, 12. So, Sarah laughed. When the angel told Abraham, you're going to have a son through Sarah, she laughed. He, she thought, and after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, and now I'm going to have this pleasure. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? Verse 14, Genesis 18, 14. Write that down, Genesis 18, 14. The angel said to Abram, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return at this appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Of course, <coughs> Isaac. She had, Isaac was a joy to them. And Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, and, and on and on. Abraham was the father of many nations because God promised him that long ago, but it took, it took a long time. But she laughed. 
And then even, even uh, in these passages, we're talking here about Zacharias and his promised a son named John. I want to tell you about that son. John would become John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is the one who's going to baptize Jesus. We'll read about that uh, in several weeks. And when John the Baptist, who we're talking about here, when he baptized Jesus, a, the Spirit of God came from heaven as a dove and landed on Jesus. And John heard a voice from heaven. The Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. How much more evidence would you want? John saw that. John heard that. John, John shared that. But in Luke chapter 7, we find that John the Baptist is now in prison. He's in prison because he has criticized uh, the king of that time. And John the Baptist is in prison. And listen to what John the Baptist does. He's in prison in, in that place. He's been waiting. And uh, John's disciples go to him and tell him all about Jesus and what he's doing. And calling them, Luke 7, 19, John the Baptist sent them to Jesus to ask, listen to what John the Baptist wanted to know, are you the one, are you the Messiah who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Can you imagine how Jesus felt when John's disciples came and shared with him, your cousin John the Baptist, the one who baptized you, he wants to know, are you really the Messiah? Or should they expect someone else? And they asked that question, and Jesus replied <coughs> to these messengers, Go back to John. Report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone that does not stumble on account of me. Now, I want you to notice Jesus' response to John the Baptist's doubts. This is so important. This is so important. It's the, whole, it's the whole point of this sermon. Then Jesus said in, 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 John, in Luke 7, 24, after John's messengers left, what did Jesus say to the crowd? Well, we hoped for John the Baptist, but he doubted, and he's, he's not one of us anymore. He's not a member of Belvoir Baptist Church. Sorry, I'm sorry to tell you that John the Baptist is falling. Fallen away. Is that what Jesus said? In, in Luke 7, 24, after John's messengers left, Jesus spoke to the crowd. What did you go outside to see? A reed swayed by the wind? A man dressed in fine clothes? Uh, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than that, this is the one. John the Baptist is the one about whom Malachi wrote, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way for you. And then verse 28, Luke 7, 28, after hearing about John's doubts, Jesus said, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. No one greater than John the Baptist. Take heart. Take heart, brother and sister. Take heart, dear ones. When, when we have doubts, God does not turn his back on us. When we have our doubts and, and we come with these struggles, God doesn't turn us away because we've had doubts. And that's why we're afraid. We're afraid to, to doubt because God might cut us off. Jesus said of John the Baptist, there was no one greater than him. So where does that doubt come from? It's a problem for the righteous. Where does doubt come from? It does not come from a lack of evidence. Doubt does not come from a lack of evidence. Doubt comes from a sinful heart. When we have doubts, it's because we are doubting God. We've stopped believing. We've stopped trusting. We've stopped praying. And it's a sinful heart that leads to those doubts. Doubts. Have you ever said or have, have you ever had someone say to you, if I could see a miracle, I believe in God. If I could see God do something big, I, I would believe. If God wrote it on the wall uh, that he's there, I, I would believe it. If I, I prayed, if God would answer my prayer, I'd believe. Is that true? Would they? Do they? No. Uh, there's, a, there's a great story in Luke 16 later on. Uh, Luke chapter 16. 
about the rich man and Lazarus. I don't know if you remember that story or not, but the rich man and Lazarus are at the gate, and the rich man dies. This is in Luke uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 25. And both of them die, and uh, Lazarus goes to heaven to be with God, and Abraham is there. And the rich man goes down to Hades, where there's torment and fire, because he has not believed in the Messiah. And uh, so the rich man is in Hades, and he says, uh, he says he wants someone to go back. He's got five brothers still alive, and he wants someone to warn his brothers not to come to Hades. Don't come to hell where I am. Warn them. And Luke 16, 25, Abraham says, Son, you remember that in your lifetime you received every good thing. Lazarus received bad things. Now, he's comforted here, and you're in agony. Besides all this, between us, there's a great chasm. Between heaven and hell, there's a great chasm set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone come over to us. And verse 27, the rich man said, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let Lazarus warn them. So that they will not come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They, your five brothers, who are still living, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if someone came back from the dead, they would repent. Verse 31, he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. That's the story that Jesus told. If people are not willing to, to read God's word and believe, if they're not willing to listen to your testimony about what God has done for you, then it doesn't matter if an angel appeared to them or something that they would not believe. They have to make a decision in their heart. Doubt is not a problem with evidence. We have more than enough evidence right here in this room that God is alive. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That he's coming back again. We take the rest of the time. Everybody give a testimony. And the evidence is here. Doubt is not a problem of evidence. It's an evidence of a sinful heart. A problem of the sinful heart. But doubt does come from... Doubt does come from disappointment. Doubt does come from long-term trials. Like uh, Abraham and Sarah. A long-term trial without a child. Uh, like Zacharias and Elizabeth, a long-term with no child in unanswered prayer. Uh, like John the Baptist, a long-term in prison and, and no reply. And maybe you have that kind of prayer today. Maybe you've got a prayer request that you've been praying for years and years and years and doubt creeps up from long-term disappointment and long-term trial. Uh, we, we talk about unanswered prayer. I've said the, the phrase, unanswered prayer. But really, there's not an unanswered prayer. God answers all of our prayers. Sometimes the answer is not now, or this is not my will, or keep trusting in me. God answers all of those prayers. But we've been there, and we, we've seen that. There's a, there's a funny story in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 17. Uh, Acts chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 17. Uh, Herod Agrippa has come into charge over Jerusalem, and he's taken James. James was the pastor. We just studied James. James was pastor of the first church that formed in Jerusalem after Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit came. They formed a church, and James. Uh, was uh, there, and he was the pastor. So Herod Agrippa arrested James and had him beheaded. And now he has arrested Peter. And he's, he's going to do the same thing to Peter. Peter is in prison, and the church is gathered, and they're praying for Peter. They're saying, Lord, free Peter, save Peter. Do they really believe that? They prayed for James, and it didn't turn out so well. And they've been praying for Peter. Well, the, the Holy Spirit releases Peter from prison. Do you remember that? The shackles fell off, the doors opened, Peter walked out, and Peter decided to go to the, the church and let them know. And he's outside of the church, knocking on the door. 
And there's a little <coughs> there's a little slave girl there, and she comes to the door, and she recognizes it's Peter, but she doesn't let him in. She runs back and she tells the church, Peter's here. Peter's been released from prison. He's here. And what does the church say? Get out of here. Come on, sit, sit down. We're praying for Peter. Stop, stop interrupting us. They don't believe her. And so finally, they all go. She doesn't, she doesn't be, she's not quiet. And Peter comes in and there's still fellowship and God answers the prayer. But aren't we that church? Aren't we like that? We pray, we have prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and we pray these serious prayers for healing and for safety and for all these things, but do we really believe it? Especially, especially if there is a delay. Because when I pray, when I pray, I, I pray, Lord, heal me, heal me, I'll open this opportunity and do it right now. And then there's a delay. We pray in God's will, and it takes time. The, the other thing I wanted to mention today about the solution for <coughs> doubt. The solution for doubt. We don't have to live in doubt. The solution for doubt sometimes is to see that God will do what he says. God will do what he says, what he promises. Remember that Luke is writing this gospel to Theophilus. We think he's probably uh, a Roman guard, a Roman captain of the guard. He's a new believer. He wants to believe these things about Jesus. And, he, and Luke is writing to him to convince him that these things he's heard about Jesus are true. And he's sharing with him what God says to him will come true. So we look at the prophetic voice. We look at the prophetic word. The very last verse of the Old Testament is Malachi 4, 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. That's the last verse of the Old Testament. And now we're in Luke of the New Testament. And that verse is used, that verse is given by the angel to Zechariah about the son he's going to have. John the Baptist is going to be that son. When Jesus talks about John the Baptist, he refers to this verse. That verse was 400 years ago. That's a long time to wait for John the Baptist, don't you think? 400 years. Isaiah prophesied about the coming Messiah. The Christ who would come and redeem Israel. He promised the people. <coughs> God promised he would come. Eight hundred years. Well, Jesus promised his disciples he would come back. He promised. That's been <laughs> two thousand years ago. But we look at scriptures and how God always does what he says. He will do. And then sometimes we have to look at God's loving discipline. Because of doubts, sometimes God lovingly and graciously and gently disciplines us. We see in our text today that we read, uh, how can I be sure of this? Luke 1, 18. I'm an old man, it didn't make sense. And the angel said, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent by God to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because, because you did not believe my words, which will come true in the proper time. So the rest of our text, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when Zechariah came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. <coughs> and when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me. She said, these days he has shown his 
favor and taken it away by disgrace among the people. Why was why did God strike Zechariah with to be mute because of his unbelief? Why wasn't he struck? Why didn't he strike him with blindness? Why didn't he make him lame? Why didn't he give him leprosy? Why did he give, why did he make Zechariah mute so that he could not share the good news? Because doubt has no voice. Doubt has no voice in God's world. Only truth can speak. And when Zechariah and when John the Baptist is born, we'll read about this later on. When John the Baptist is born, uh, verse 67, he will open his lips and he will praise God for this little baby. Faith has a voice. Doubt has nothing to say. Faith has a voice. So what, what can we do with this? Very quickly, I want to give you some Bible verses and some truths when you have doubts, when we have doubts. <coughs> when we have doubts, what, what can we do? Uh, you may not have Gabriel may not come to you and show up with the Word of God. But here's some things that have happened. First, remember Christ died for you. John 3.16. That is a fact. That, that's not going to change. You, you, you can't doubt that. Jesus died for you and for me. And when we have doubts, we need to go to that old verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. That's, that's, a, that's a fact. And when we have doubts, is there really a God? Come back and, and stand on John 3, 16. Jesus died for you. Secondly, God loved you even when you were a sinner. Even when you were a sinner. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. When you were still dead in sin, God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he had loved for us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I've heard people say that, that God looked down and he saw something good in, in us. He saw something good in us and he saved us. That's not true. That is not True. God did not look down and see something good in me and decide to save me. There was nothing good in me. Even while I was sinful and turning away from God, He saved me through Jesus Christ. By grace, you're saved through faith. Third, He is our Heavenly Father. People are afraid of God. The man upstairs, He's going to strike down, He's going to crush us like little bugs on the sidewalk. They're afraid of God. No. God is a loving, heavenly Father. And we can turn to Him. 1 John 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. God loves us. Fourth, God has compassion on you. God is not up in heaven on the throne waiting to judge you for your sins. That's not true. That is not true. When we, when we begin to doubt God or have doubts about God, read any of the Psalms. Psalm 86, 15. Psalm 86, 15. But you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Fifth, God's plans for you are good. Don't be afraid that God's going to ask you to do something horrible and terrible that's going to ruin your life. That is not true. God loves you and His plans are perfect. Jeremiah 29 11. Jeremiah 29 11. I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Number six be still and know that he is God. When doubt comes and doubt overwhelms you, it will come. It comes even to the righteous. When that happens, stop all the churning and thinking and wondering and be still and know that he 
is God. Psalm 4610. Psalm 4610. Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. That's hard in today's technology. Cell phone beeping, message coming in, phone call, response, Facebook, all that. It's hard to find a place and be still, but be still. And then finally, pray. Mark 9.24. Mark 9.24. Jesus said, uh, in the healing, he was healing the boy. And, G and the man said, I do believe. <clears throat> Help my unbelief. Pray. Help my unbelief. When we have doubts, when we're up against the wall, when we're doubting God, pray and ask God. Help thou my unbelief. It's a great story. <clears throat> I wanted to touch on it today. I want you to know that the people in the Bible are just like us. They are just like us. They struggle with doubt. Here's Zechariah. And, and here's Gabriel. God sent me to tell you you're going to have a son. How can I be sure? <laughs> <laughs> but he came back. And God was faithful. And he had that child that later we're going to talk about later this month. He held that child in his arms and he praised God. His mouth was open. Not to share his doubts, but to share praise of God. Let's stand together for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this experience that Zechariah had. And it's recorded in Luke's gospel for us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for sharing this honesty, these people. Uh, Abraham, Sarah, and Zechariah and Elizabeth. And on and on in the Bible, those that are your chosen, your children, they have doubts. We have doubts, Heavenly Father. Help, help our unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray.